Okay, welcome back to part seven, the final part of the capnography tutorial. You've made it to the final part, okay? Uh, in this part, we're going to talk about the use of capnography and get some um, scenarios out of the way. Um, you know, different case presentations of the use of capnography. So, just a quick little uh, chart to help you remember. An increase in entitled in CO2. Uh, the ventilation causes would be hypoventilation, bronchoconstriction, or drug overdose. The circulation causes would be good CPR, return of, of spontaneous circulation, increased cardiac output, and the metabolic causes of an increased in tidal CO2 would be fever, uh, seizure, burns, and muscular use. Okay, the decreased in tidal CO2, all the things that cause decreased in tidal CO2. The ventilatory causes, hyperventilation, a dislodged ET tube, Circulatory, apnea, cardiac arrest, pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolism. This apnea probably should be under ventilation, right? Um, and metabolic causes, DKA, sepsis, hypothermia. It's just important to know that these things can cause an increase in entitled CO2, and these things can cause a decrease in entitled CO2. So let's do a scenario. You've just intubated a patient that has severe dyspnea and you used RSI successfully. They've got a blood pressure of 142 over 90, a heart rate of 140, and the respiratory rate's assisted. Let's say you have them at 12 to 20, <laughs> within a normal range, uh, 14, okay? And uh, their blood glucose is 170. So we get this capnography value back. What should this make you think? Well, it could be a number of things, right? Well, we want to double check, make sure our ventilatory rate's fast enough because is this high or low? This would be high, right? An entitled CO2 of 55. We have a normal plateau, so we're not seeing anything on the capnogram picture itself that makes us think that there's an issue. It's just that it's too high. It's too high. What's causing this to be high? Well, if we look back at our list that I just gave you, all these things that can cause an increase, well, they're not having hyperventilation because we're doing that for them. Drug overdose, I don't think we've given them any opiates. We RSI them. Some people do give opiates with RSI, but that would just be a ventilatory issue with rate. So we're giving them a good rate. There's no bronchoconstriction. It doesn't look shark finned. We're not dealing with a cardiac arrest patient. Going down, what is this? Fever, hypothermia. They're not, they're not seizing. There's no burns. They're not using their muscles. But hyperthermia, what can be hypothermic with this RSI patient? It could be malignant hyperthermia. We used RSI. Remember, using especially a depolarizing paralytic can cause patients with history of malignant hyperthermia to have uh, a hyperthermic state and increase CO2 value. So obviously, you would take a temperature and kind of confirm that uh, diagnosis. So here's another scenario. You have an 88-year-old male. He's fallen on the ground and is currently unconscious. He's fallen on the ground and he's unconscious. He's got a blood pressure of 114 over 70. I'm okay with that. Heart rate of 50. Seems maybe a little bit slow. Respiratory rate's 10. That's slow. And his blood glucose is 90. Let's see his cap capnogram. Whoa. That's a low value. I'm kind of concerned about this low value with a respiratory rate of 10 especially. Right? 25? You, if your respiratory rate's lower, you should have a higher entitled CO2. So this is concerning. Taking everything into account, it's an 88-year-old male. He's on the ground, and he's unconscious, and his, rest, his heart rate's 50, so it's a slower heart rate. We're thinking about the things that can cause bradycardia, unresponsiveness, and a decrease in respiratory rate with a decrease in entitled, entitled CO2. Well, it's not... It's not hypoglycemia, it's hypothermia. Oh, it's the other end of the spectrum. Okay, hypothermia. Well, this patient's laying on the ground. Is it a tile floor? Maybe I should have thrown that in there. Um, a tile floor, laying on a tile floor, especially an old patient that can't thermoregulate very well, they can have a decrease in their body temperature and they can have a decrease in the entitled CO2 because of that, because they're having a decrease in cellular metabolism. So. It would cause a bradycardia, it would cause a bradypnea, and it could cause hypocapnia. 
The next scenario, let's say you respond to a 75-year-old female who's got altered mental status. Well, that doesn't tell us a whole lot. They have got a blood pressure of 100 over 40, heart rate tachycardic 130, respiratory rate 30, blood glucose 100. That's interesting. Uh, so we have a lot of information here. Capnography is low. Okay, well, we would expect it to be low with a, an increase in respiratory rate. So that kind of fits. So other conditions. We're thinking about why does this patient have altered mental status? They're 75 years old. What are they at high risk for? Uh, they, blood pressure, 100 over 40. That seems maybe a little bit low for a, uh, an elderly uh, patient. Maybe it's at low for this patient. We want to get their norms. And in, in fact, somebody would tell you, yes, let's say that their, their nursing staff tells you, yes, that's very low for this patient. Usually she's uh, hypertense. Okay, well, that kind of stands out then because we, we have hypotension with a tachycardia. That tells us it's a type of shock generally. It's, it's a com compensated shock and tachypnea. We have a normal blood glucose and a low capnography value. Low capnography value. What could this possibly be? Well, we've identified it's a type of shock, but this is sepsis. I'm giving you a sepsis scenario. Um, kind of hard to get it just from that information alone. Yeah, you don't want to use uh, other assessment findings. But if you've identified shock in this patient, you'd be correct. So uh, remember, your hemodynamic compromised patient can have uh, hypocapnia and lower entitled CO2 values. That concludes the entire course. It was seven parts. You made it through all seven of them, hopefully. And uh, hopefully you've learned something about capnography. You've learned that it can be used for not just ventilation, but it can be used for circulation uh, assessment and cellular metabolism. It needs all three of those components and it gives you feedback on all three of those components. You've learned the shark fin pattern indicates bronchospasm. The Karar cleft indicates the need for more sedation. Um, that hyperventilation causes hypocapnia. Hypoventilation causes hypercapnia. It's a lot of information to take in. Go back through these lessons um, and learn more. There's a lot more on capnography than, than just this course alone. So learn more about it and use it on your day-to-day -day patient uh, to get kind of used to the process. I hope you enjoyed this course. I'm Adam Thompson. If you have any questions or want to provide any feedback, you can email me at paramedicine101 at gmail.com. You can also go on my blog at paramedicine101.com. And we have a Facebook site. Just type paramedicine101 into the Facebook search and find us on there because I'm constantly putting good information. I have EKG videos uh, on my on my YouTube channel, Meducator01, Meducator01. And there's going to be more to come. So... I uh, hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you in the future.